I'm Manuela. I joined Microsoft in September. Before that, I was um, actually on the customer side. And um, like Todd has said, I've worked on the um, Center of Excellence and the Center of Excellence Starter Kit and um, even collaborated on, on some of the solutions that uh, that's available out there before uh, before I joined when I was on the customer side. Please find me on, um, on Twitter to, or on LinkedIn. Um, to provide um, feedback on the center of excellence, really as part of um, as part of my team, I work closely with customers, but also with the community to really drill down onto the governance and center of excellence needs that our customers have, and um, continue to evolve um, our center of excellence starter kit. So we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by center of excellence, and then do a, a demo of um, some of the components of the CUE starter kit. When we talk about a center of excellence, we really mean kind of an idea or a concept, like a unit that makes sure that the Power Platform strategy is aligned with the digital culture of your organization and, and has a firm place there. It doesn't have to be a 20 person department. It doesn't have to be driven by your number one champion. Um, it will start small and grow. Um, the important part here is that you have a strategic investment that the CUE drives some um, innovation and improvement and breaks down silos across your business units. So you don't end up with one business unit that's using um, the Power Platform and another business unit that's still buried in Excel macros and paper printouts. So having a central team in place that that makes sure that you know your whole organization is on the same like Power Platform and digital transformation path there. Um, so yeah, it's really there to like break down those silos, silos, get those business units talking to each other, learning from their success, um, sharing solutions, sharing success stories, and sharing their knowledge. Establishing a CUE is really much more than, than tools. Um, it's about your processes, your people, your culture, and likely also a, a culture change where um, people are starting to, to come together to share your knowledge. Uh, once you've established the uh, why and what, um, you want to, uh, what you want to achieve with the Center of Excellence, the tooling can really help you with the how, um, and that's where the CUE starter kit comes in. It's a collection of apps, flows, reports of what we've learned from our customers, um, what we've seen um, succeed in the wild, basically. It means that you don't have to start from scratch. So some of the things that you might be looking at as you as you adopt the Power Platform is, you want to get a tenant-wide overview of who your top makers are. Well, we've got you covered there. You want to identify unused applications to keep your environment tidy. Well, yeah, we've got that as well. You want to highlight applications in a company-wide app catalog. Yep, got that. Some of you are going through license negotiations at the moment. You want to see who is actually using premium features, how often are they using that? Yep, there's a report for that. Um, so really what it means is that on top of the existing offering of the like admin center and the extensibility via connectors, you have a templatized implementation of best practices. That means you can get started much easier. And with that, I'd like to um, straight jump into a demo. So the CUE starter kit contains many apps, many flows, but one of the core parts is the dashboard, and that's what we see most of our customers get a lot of value um, out of. Um, so that's what I'd like to um, to demo first and spend a bit of time um, on, just because it's quite. Um, there's a lot of reports in it, and, and sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming when you install it and look at it at um, it kind of in the first place. Um, so at the core, what the um, what the CUE starter kit does is it syncs your tenant resources into CDS entities and then builds the Power BI dashboard on top of it. Um, we've broken the Power BI dashboard down into the monitor section that gives you the ability to um, query your inventory, so see how many environments you've got, how many apps you've got, how many makers there are. Um, it then goes into govern where you are able to perform risk assessment, so you're able to identify virally shared resources, uh, but also um, resources that aren't used anymore, or even resources that are orphaned where the maker has maybe left the organization. Um, so you've got full visibility of that. Um, and then there's a the nurture part, so you can find your um, star app makers, your flow gurus, and you can put them to good use by making them share their success stories or supporting some of the newer makers there. I'm demoing this from my CUE development environment, so if anything goes wrong, I'll blame it on that. We've also got a thunder, thunderstorm happening outside, so you know, um, it's quite a risky um, demo at the moment. Um, so once you get past the introduction, you can um, select overview, and this gives you um, an, a tenant-wide overview of everything that you've got in your tenants. So you can see your environments, your makers, how many app makers and apps flow makers and flows you've got. You can see your top makers here. Um, and if you're a multinational company, you can identify hotspots of makers across 
across the globe and you get the same information for flows as well here. So there might be like different trends here um, where um, Megan is my top app maker, but Adele and Lee are, are, are top uh, flow makers. Um, I'm Lee in that tenant, so I've got a bit of a competition going on there. And then, so that's kind of the overview. So really good to, to get an overview of what's going on in your in your tenant, and then you can um, see start identifying trends. And I think that's it's really important that you notice if your adoption is going if you if your adoption is going up. For example, you're hosting an internal training event, a hackathon. Does that impact the adoption of the uh, of the platform overall? So you can see um, who's creating environments, what type of environments are being created. Um, you can use the rich filters within um, within Power BI to drill down into um, specific time segments or look at specific. Um, environments that are being created. So that's again like part of the overview. Where it gets really interesting is when you look at the um, apps information and then the flow information. Um, we're gathering all the information in your tenant, but also connecting to the audit log to get um, launch information. Um, so we know how many unique users and sessions you've got in your tenant. And um, like it's it's painting a really good picture of you of your highly used applications that might be critical and um, that might need a stronger support model around that um, or some of the success stories that you want to share. So you can again see that creation trend of applications broken down into the three types here. You can see how many are created this month, how many makers you've got, etc. And then again, you could say, okay, I've run a hackathon here and it's really improved the um, adoption of the platform. Um, you can identify through the connector to Office 365. If your AD is up to date, um, your top departments that are adopting the platform. So clearly the marketing department in this case is an early adopter of the platform. Um, they're kind of spearheading the adoption much further ahead than some of the other departments. So maybe you can reach out to them and ask them to share their success stories, organize a show and tell session um, for some of the other departments to really share what they're doing. And then you can see some of the applications that are highly used. So in my um, in my demo tenant, that's, it's not it's not that much, um, but in your tenant, that will give you really valuable information about your top applications, um, who's creating them, when they were last launched, um, how many sessions there are, um, how many unique users you've got, and the same information is available um, to to flows as well. So again, you've got the creation trend, you've got how many actions are within a flow, so you can identify complex flows, for example. You've got the flow state as well, um, so some of the flows are marked as suspended, and you've got the highlight number here as well. Flows are suspended if they violate DLP or billing restrictions, so you might have a DLP policy set up. Um, you've added that after the flow was created, um, it impacts one of the flows and suspends it, therefore. Um, the maker might not even be aware that their flow has stopped running, so this is a really good way of helping that maker reaching out to them, seeing what they're doing, and maybe migrate their flow to a different environment, or um, helping them get that flow into an active state again if it's needed, or archiving and deleting that flow if it's not needed anymore, just to keep your environments tidy. Um, so that's from an over overview point of view, you've got the same information for like for custom connectors and makers as well. And then connections, it's where it get, gets really interesting, where you want to see the connectors that are being used across your resources, across your makers. And from here, through the metadata of a connector, you can select a connector tier. So you, from here, I can see premium connectors. I can see these are my premium connectors that are being used across my resources. These are the makers that are using them. Um, and for your kind of license planning, like especially premium license planning, that is really helpful to know um, who those makers are, who those departments are, and who those resources are that are using uh, premium functionality. Obviously quite high in my demo tenant. Um, if that's not kind of still not enough information for you, you can drill down even further um, and say, actually, I just want to see who's using the Azure, like one of the Azure connectors. I'm trying to find one that I know we're using. Let's see common data service there. So again, I'd, like I've drilled down further um, to see, well, I've got 50 uh, applications, but 600 flows that are using the common data service. Maybe not all of them are needed anymore. Uh, maybe I can archive some of them and I can again look at um, some of the creation dates there. So from an kind of administration point of view, having visibility of what's going on in your tenant is one of the most important parts to be able to adopt it and to govern it because you can't govern what you can't see. So having that full visibility is, is really helpful and that's um, part of why we've got that deep dive available within the dashboard here. Um, but then we, we're kind of taking it one step uh, further based on some of the customer um, feedback that we got. And we've now got app and flow um, risk assessments and that really 
I think what's a risk to your company is like is very um, subjective. Um, so we've included a couple of filters here, but we are providing you with the Power BI dashboard file, so you can really like change that to whatever you can uh, you perceive as a risk. Um, one of the risks might be if an application is shared with everyone in the tenant. So I can easily identify that here. I can see I've got two applications shared with the entire tenant. App catalog, probably fair. Everyone needs access to that. This Power Apps template, not sure what that is. I don't think that needs to be shared with the entire organization. So I can reach out to Lee and um, ask Lee to maybe unshare that or reconsider who that application is shared with. Um, they might have accidentally shared it with everyone. Another risk is applications that are shared with a high number of individual users, um, where it's easy for a maker to lose oversight of who the application is actually shared with. And then some of those users might um, change departments and not need the application anymore. Um, so it's also like part of an admin's role is the ability to reach out to the maker and say, hey, I can create an Azure Active Directory group for you. Um, you can share the application with that group, we'll establish a movers and levers, a joiners process for um, the departments or job roles that need that application. And then that weight is of the um, maker to, to manage all of, um, all of that um, as well. Um, so some of those tasks can be performed for um, apps and flows as well. And similarly, something that you and um, probably the, yeah, one of the last demos I'll do is um, the archive. So applications that are unused but still shared will clog up your environment. They'll um, show up in the Parks mobile player. Um, so users might be confused about why they're still seeing applications even so they've not used them for months. Um, so we've introduced an archive score and um, the score is based on when the application was last launched, but also on, on indicators like, um, is it using a, a word like test or demo in the title? Is it likely a template? Um, has it not been modified since it was created? Um, so we've sorted the, that screen here by the highest archive score. And uh, you could um, go into those applications and delete them from the environment or like at least unshare them. Uh, so only the maker has access to them to make sure that your um, end users have a really tidy and clean experience of your application. Of your of the power platform um, estate, um, so those are kind of some of like key criteria that we've got as part of that overview. And then in terms of kind of nurture, it's also really important for you to identify your um, your top makers and what they're using because your champions, um, like in some cases we've seen with um, Schlumberger and um, the digital um, agents that he's got is. Um, those those champions can really transform the entire organization and pave the way for um, for other um, for other users. So here I can see that um, Megan is using quite a lot of connectors. I can see what connectors they're using. If I then select, for example, um, Alex, um, I can see they're uh, probably a, a traditional developer because um, they're using Logic Flow, CDS, HTTP. Um, if I select um, Johnny here, um, they're using mainly Office connectors. So maybe Johnny and Megan can like learn from each other. Maybe Megan has a trick or two to teach um, Johnny. And that dashboard helps me enable that conversation between the makers um, there so I can guide them in the right way. Um, so the dashboard is a really um, small part of the um, starter kit. There's many more assets to it, but um, some of the um, it's kind of the heart of, uh, the heart of it and what we see most of our customers um, adopt. I'd like to pause here for a second. I think I'm also out of time, but are there any questions? We had a couple questions regarding yeah. if you don't want to use CDS, what mm -hmm. are your options? A couple people chimed in and said, hey, you can use SharePoint as a data source. With the standard license, Reza mentioned that. I know that other folks in the industry, I know some folks who have converted it to use SQL, actually. Yeah, um, yeah. So we ship it uh, as a solution with um, CDS just because that's the simplest way for us to ship it. Um, if you use it, if you're interested in only the dashboard, actually only the admin persona needs a needs a premium license. So it's only uh, potentially like one or one or two people that are your power platform admins that need those, that need that license. Um, so it's uh, from that point of view, it's not maybe not as massive an investment as getting it for your whole um, organization just to get started. Um, the dashboard will provide you with the tenant wide overview. Um, yeah, and then we have like some partners that have ported it to SharePoint, um, for example, as well. So yeah, um, it's not, I think what we're looking at, 
like some of the wider shared components. We've got it on our roadmap to make them easier accessible with um, with standard licenses. Um, but the, for the admin components, um, we will like continue to rely on um, on CDS there. That's great. I, this one doesn't come from the audience. My question was more about what do you see is like the first thing that people do in a large org after they install this and they discover the sprawl that has occurred? Like, what is the very first step you like to get going with? Yeah, so um, this is a horrible slide, so I didn't have time to format that better. So the first thing we recommend is getting um, getting familiar with the documentation. Um, we've recently moved it to docs.microsoft.com um, and really invested a lot into the what's part of the CV starter kit and how to use it sections. And we're also recording videos at the moment um, to make that easier um, to, to get started so you can view the video. And then like spend a lot of time getting familiar with the admin components and the dashboard and really think about the processes, like think about your risk assessments, think about what you want to archive and then plan your data loss prevention um, policy. If you don't already have DLP policies um, set up, that's vital um, to ensure um, administration and governance that's vital to protect your data and then use the DLP editor that I didn't demo to mitigate the risk of a DLP policy negatively affecting um, the resources. And then um, if you've already got organic adoption and viral adoption through the Office 365 um, seeded license, look at your orphan resources and assign them new owners. So orphan resources are where the maker has left the organization. Um, so they're showing um, they're still like apps are still usable. Um, so uh, end users can still use those applications, but obviously there's no one there to maintain them. There's no owner there. So ensure that they have new owners assigned, maybe from their um, from their department, etc. And then also identify unused resources that are just clogging up your environment. So the 500 device um, ordering. Um, applications that are um, in your default environment um, that makers might have shared with their department because they were really proud of their of their application. And now, if you look at the mobile application, you have to scroll through all of those device ordering apps um, to get to the app that you're actually looking for. And then the the second, um, so the point five and six on um, planning a governance strategy and embracing the maker community, we see. Um, usually happen hand in hand. Um, so it's typically a change management team, a business change team that um, looks after kind of the nurture strategy. So uh, onboarding new makers, organizing internal events, um, doing show and tell sessions. And then the admin team that's looking at um, uh, processes to like what to do with non-compliant applications, what audits do I want to run, what risk assessments do I want to do. Um, so that's typically the lot of time spent here and then these kind of follow. Yeah, that makes sense. What has what your typical experience been and what you've seen with customers on when they start with nothing and now they're mm -hmm. at the point where they've got it installed and they've mm -hmm. gone through all these steps and it's just moving along? Um, what's the start to finish time on that typically that you're seeing? Is it is it a month, a week? Um, so it's uh, don't install this, you start a kit just to um, check a box. Um, it's not a tick box exercise, it's a living and breathing um, piece. So the dashboard you would, um, some of our administrators use um, daily or at least weekly to get more insights into their adoption. Um, some of the like audit pieces or nurture pieces again um, are quite like frequently used. Um, and then a lot of our administrators also um, extend the series starter kit to fit their needs. So they put in um, like a license request model uh, or an environment request model based on kind of some of the entities that we've got. Um, so I can't, like installing it, you can do in an hour. Getting familiar with it, you can do in a week, but it's not, yeah, don't do not do it to just um, tick a box. It, it really is driven by your by your digital transformation. So it's something that you should use and really embed in your processes. And, and make use of um, for for a long time. That makes sense. It reminds me a whole lot of getting a hold on uh, SharePoint governance and uh, SharePoint forms mm. across an org, how you attack that. Do you also see the similarity between this and how a, a, an org that is properly governing SharePoint will assign at least a part-time, a full-time resource to do this? We've 
funnily enough, that, that with some of our organizations that are also heavily adopting SharePoint, um, they they are working with partners to extend the dashboard to also show them SharePoint information because um, the the organization saw the the CV starter kit dashboard and they loved the overview we gave them and they've asked the partner to. Um, put the same information in place for their SharePoint and Teams adoption, so they get a bigger picture of of what's going on. So, but yeah, I think it it does. Yeah, it's it's in line with kind of a dedicated resource looking after that. And um, there's many roles in that. So, like the nurture part can definitely be driven by champions, but like the DLP strategy has to come from your um, administrate um, administrators. That's great. I, there's a lot of people on the call given big time kudos to the COE here who've already tried it. And I see several people are excited to try that out themselves too. Really awesome. nice. I look forward to seeing how you continue to evolve this because since you've joined Microsoft, this has evolved so much in just the past, what was that about November you joined if I recall yes. right before night? Yeah. yeah. My yeah. gosh, yeah. it's just nine months and this thing's grown by leaps and bounds. So yeah, we're running for- it like a, uh, yeah, we're running it like a product now. So we've got a DevOps um, pipeline, um, DevOps board um, to manage our work items and backlog. And we're planning on like writing up um, some of the best practices that we found out in developing the CUE kit on how to manage like Power Platform proje- uh, projects um, across multiple environments, like across the dev test and prod environment with an uh, application lifecycle management um, process. So yeah, um, it helps us a lot in providing feedback to the product team as well on, on some of that um, some of that process. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the feedback. I'll, I'll see some of the questions in the chat window, so I'll, um, I'll answer that in the Teams chat. Sounds good. Thanks for joining today. I know you have to scoot off to another presentation here too. So uh, have a great day. No, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I hope it was valuable. You're welcome.